Okay, everyone, welcome to lecture 3-2 on the eye and the orbit. The orbit is actually the cavity in the skull in which the eye resides. So the eye is at one of the contents of the orbit. So now let's talk about the eye. The eye is composed of three different layers. The first of these layers is the uh, fibrous layer. The sclera of the eye, the whites of your eye, is part of this fibrous layer. And the sclera is continuous with the cornea of your eye, which is the anterior clear part through which you can see your iris and the lens of your eye. The next layer is the uh, choroidal layer, the vascular layer. And in this layer, uh, we have the pigmented cells as well as the vasculature that supplies the retina of the eye. The uh, choroid is a pigmentation that helps reduce the refraction of light uh, to uh, clarify your vision and make sure light's not bouncing around, uh, hitting different parts of the eye. So uh, <clears throat> next, deep to that layer on the innermost portion of the eye is the neural layer. That neural, neural layer is called the retina and it's composed of the rods and cones as well as the bipolar and ganglion cells that uh, receive that photonic energy and transfer it into an action potential that the central nervous system can recognize. So now let's uh, take a cross section through the eye and look at the anterior portion. These three layers, or these two layers, uh, the retina and the choroid layer extend anteriorly to a point called the aura serrata. At the aura serrata, those layers end and give way to the ciliary uh, body, which uh, is composed of the ciliaris muscle as well as the ciliary processes. Coming off of the ciliary processes are zonular fibers, or sometimes called suspensory ligaments, that attach all the way around uh, the lens in order to produce the function of accommodation, which is changing the shape of the lens to look at, uh, to focus on distance or near objects. So recognize that this is a 2D image, but uh, this is a 3D structure. This is just one thin slice of a 3D structure. And so the ciliary body is circular around the entire lens of the eye, and it's attaching via these zonular fibers to the lens like bicycle spokes on a wheel. Uh, so we can see these processes attaching to the lens, and here we're uh, learning about that process of accommodation. So with uh, parasympathetic innervation of the ciliary muscle, that's going to cause contraction of this smooth ciliary muscle, and that contraction is going to cause the sphincter of this muscle, which this muscle is a sphincter, to, uh, to, uh, to become smaller. Uh, so the radius of this muscle is shortening with parasympathetic innervation. As a result, uh, that causes the zonular fibers to relax or become slack, and it allows the lens to become bulbous and bulge out. Uh, during, so that's the process uh, that occurs for uh, focusing on near objects. So that bulbing of the lens allows the light to focus uh, on these nearer objects. In the absence of any nerve stimulation, the ciliaris muscle uh, becomes relaxed, and so that circle stretches. The zonular uh, fibers pull on the lens and flatten the lens out. So our resting state is distance vision. That's what our eyes are designed to view. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, you might be aware of this. You've been studying for a long time, reading a book at close range, or staring at your computer monitor, and your eyes start to hurt uh, because you've been working that tiny little ciliaris muscle sphincter that entire time. You've been constantly providing it with an action potential to shorten that muscle and contract that muscle, and your eyes get sore. Uh, so that's the process happening there. Now, Next, in this image, we see the iris of the eye, which is the uh, pigmented muscular structure that we can see through our cornea. That iris separates uh, the uh, front part of the eye into an anterior chamber and a posterior chamber. Uh, so those chambers uh, are filled with an aqueous humor, which is a, a fairly clear liquid our, our eyes produce in order to allow for uh, the transmission of light through the cornea, through the chamber, the anterior chamber, to the lens. And finally, uh, 
to the vitreous body, which is the refractory medium inside the eye itself. Uh, so you can see light will be coming in through the cornea, aqueous humor in the anterior chamber, through the lens, and then through the vitreous body, uh, this transparent but very solid, firm, gel-like uh, substance that uh, really supports the lens and pushes the lens against the iris to maintain the shape of the eye. Uh, that shape is critical in allowing us to um, have clear vision and focus appropriately. Now, if we look through an ophthalmoscope, this is what the back of the eye looks like. We'll be able to see the uh, arteries of the eye, the uh, central retinal artery, as it travels through the disc, the optic disc in the posterior portion of the eye. But the portion that is uh, clearest in our vision is called the uh, fovea centralis within the macula lutea. And this is the region where these arteries are not getting in the way and the uh, rods and cones have the most clear uh, and impact or, or impacted uh, most clearly by photons as they enter. Uh, so here we're highlighting the optic disc. The optic disc is actually our blind spot. It's, it's the blind spot because this is where uh, rods and cones do not exist because it's a hole in the back of our eye where the arteries can enter the eye. Uh, so it's also the place where all of the central processes of the ganglion cell converge and then travel deep to exit the posterior portion of the eye. So that's why we can't see anything in that blind spot. Now here we are seeing actual images from an ophthalmoscope. We can see a normal retina and we can see an example of papilledema where uh, something like intracranial pressure is pushing blood into the eye, uh, engorging those retinal arteries. And you can see them enlarged here. You can see the optic disc is swollen as a result. Here you can see a very nice small optic disc with a clear fovea centralis. And here you can see uh, the fovea centralis is being overcome by those retinal arteries. So now let's talk about the orbit. Of course, the orbit uh, is composed of a number of different bones that form the borders of it. A lot of these bones are very solid and have uh, thick structures to protect the eye and the arteries and the nerves that are in that region, except for the central portion of the eye, or the orbit, which is composed of the ethmoid bone and, and the ethmoid air cells. So it's uh, uncommon for fractures of the orbit to occur, for instance, in the frontal bone or in perhaps the maxillary bone. Um, but these air cells in the ethmoid bone are very thin, very weak, and so blowout fractures, for instance, say a baseball hits somebody right in the eye, uh, that can cause fractures in the ethmoid air cells, uh, even without other uh, obvious external uh, signs. Now let's look at all the other stuff that's in the eye, the, the, um, you know, the fat, the fascia, all of that connective tissue before we get into the musculature. So the uh, orbital periosteum is the connective tissue that's uh, lining the bones of the orbit. And that, uh, uh, that orbital periosteum uh, extends anteriorly onto the eyelids, both the superior and inferior eyelids. And when it does, it loses the periosteum name because it's not on the bone. Now it's called periorbita. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> we also have some additional fascia called the bulbar fascia. The bulbar fascia surrounds the eye, cushions it, and holds it in place within the orbit. We'll see that the, uh, the extraocular muscles actually have to pierce the bulbar fascia in order to attach to the eye and to cause its uh, movement, the, the direction of gaze that the extraocular muscles perform. And so here we see um, uh, this bulbar fascia, sometimes again called the suspensory ligament. Uh, so there's lots of suspensory ligaments. Uh, I'm trying to use terms, uh, other terms that make more sense. So the bulbar fascia does form a suspensory component uh, of this. And we can see that it also has these check ligaments on either side. So those help to uh, keep the eye 
where it's supposed to limit its abduction and adduction uh, within the orbit as well as maintain it, uh, its attachments to the sides of the orbit, kind of like a hammock hanging uh, within the orbit. And here you can see the extraocular muscles as they pierce portions of that uh, bulbar fascia. <clears throat> Next we have the mucosal layer of the eye, the conjunctiva. The conjunctiva uh, extends uh, to the cornea and inside the, um, the eyelids, and we can actually see a portion of that conjunctiva on the medial portion of our eyes. It's called the plica semilunaris. Uh, there are inflection points called fornices, so whenever we see an inflection in the body, uh, that, that creates a small cavity that's called a, a fornix. So we have a superior and inferior fornix call, caused by the conjunctiva in the eye. So this also prevents uh, objects from, you know, traveling deep around the eye. It limits uh, how much exposure the eye has to the external environment. And here you can see examples of that plica semilunaris in the medialmost portion of the eye. So if something gets in the uh, mucosa of the eye, it'll cause inflammation. You can see that redness, not only in the uh, sclera, but also in the plica semilunaris, the conjunctiva around the eye. Uh, so that's the pink eye process. Now the eyelids need uh, these harder connective tissue plates called tarsal plates. Uh, at the uh, ends of their eyes. And these are kind of like windshield washers that wipe away dust or debris or uh, uh, tears in the eye as, as we blink. And so that's a very critical part. So they actually rest against the surface of the eye and uh, brush uh, substances out of the eye. So now let's start talking about some of the muscles here. Um, that are in the orbit. And the first muscle we'll talk about is the most superior. It is levator palpebrae superioris. Uh, you know, its name is what it does. It elevates the eyelid. It's the superior, the most superior muscle, and it elevates the eyelid. So interestingly, uh, this muscle has a smooth muscle component to it, superior tarsal muscle, and you can see superior tarsal muscle attaching directly to the uh, tarsal plate via the, um, the periorbita. So this smooth muscle component is sympathetically innervated. So when our sympathetic nervous system is activated, we have an autonomic response to raise our eyelids. This lets in more light, more information in a fight or flight situation scenario so our eyes can get as much information as possible. And so that's what uh, that uh, superior tarsal muscle does. But we also have control to blink our eyes and to open them if we're tired and we want to open our eyes even though we're tired. Uh, so we have a skeletal muscle control over that function as well. Now, these are the gaze directing muscles of the orbit that attach to the eye. We're gonna have four recti muscles in the cardinal coordinates, uh, superior, inferior, uh, medial, and lateral. And you can see those here attaching. We also have oblique muscles, which I'm showing you here in blue and green. The superior oblique muscle uh, has this interesting directionality. It, it originates in the posterior orbit moves anteriorly along the medial portion of the orbit and hooks through this trochlea, or this hook. So this is a little connective tissue hook on the medial uh, superior portion of our orbit. Uh, and then it takes a hard turn and attaches uh, superiorly on the eye itself. Next, we have the <coughs> inferior oblique muscle. It doesn't uh, have this fun uh, arrangement, but it attaches medially on the eye, uh, medially on the orbit, travels uh, underneath the eye and attaches inferiorly and laterally. And so these oblique muscles uh, can kind of rotate the eye, but they also facilitate the other directionality. And we'll see why they're needed for gaze direction uh, in just a minute. So on this slide, you can see all of the actions of the extraocular muscles. These actions are important because we don't just 
activate one muscle when we're directing gaze. We have to activate multiple muscles uh, in order to uh, cancel out the gaze directions that we don't want. So for instance, if we want to elevate the eye, elevate the direction of gaze of our eye, then we're going to activate not just superior rectus muscle, which will elevate the eye, but we have to activate the inferior oblique muscle too. So both of these muscles are responsible for elevating the gaze of the eye. But take a look, we can see because of the angle of superior rectus, it will cause a slight amount of adduction, uh, movement toward the midline. So if we just use superior rectus, we're also going to, our eyes are gonna cross a little bit. So we add in inferior oblique because inferior oblique is going to abduct the gaze of the eye. We can see that because inferior oblique attaches posterior to the axis and will rotate the eye that way, abducting the gaze. So when we activate both of these muscles, we get both of them causing elevation of the gaze, but we subtract out that uh, abduction and adduction. Also, because of the angle of these muscles, if we only activate one, we're gonna get rotation of the eye as well because the superior rectus uh, has this angle to it attaching posteriorly in the orbit. Our orbits are not straight, our orbits are angled. And so these muscles attach at an angle to the back of the orbit. So here we see superior rectus is going to medially rotate the eye Inferior rectus is going to rattle, laterally rotate the eye, so when we combine those, uh, the eye doesn't rotate, the eye doesn't uh, abduct or adduct, the eye only elevates. So this principle holds true for all of the directions of the eye. Uh, this is just one of those examples. So we can see uh, that this has clinical consequences when we want to test the extraocular muscles. And this is important for testing for uh, strokes or intracranial pressure damage to the oculomotor nerve or the other nerves, trochlear abducens cranial nerves. Uh, so um, these are important means by which we can diagnose, test a patient and determine the location of a lesion. So to isolate an individual muscle and test an individual muscle, what we have to do is align that muscle with the angle of the, uh, of the pull of that muscle, which means the angle of the orbit. So in order to test superior rectus, we have to slightly abduct the eye we want to test and then ask, you know, have the patient follow that uh, movement up and then that eye will move only up. At the same time we're doing this, fortunately, the uh, inferior oblique muscle on the contralateral eye is being isolated at well as well. So this is how we do that H pattern of testing that your optometrist or, um, or physician uh, you've probably had done where they just, you know, very quickly ask you to follow the H pattern as they look at your eyes. That's what they're testing. They're testing your cranial nerves and making sure you have no deficits in those because that can cause double vision uh, or other issues. And it's a sign of, uh, you know, intracranial uh, problems as well. So it's important that that testing is done. So another slide, uh, you know, showing you uh, the concepts of how to isolate these muscles. So the angle of the orbit is about 23 degrees off of midline. So that's why uh, they test by slightly going off center uh, to align the axis of that muscle. And then so we're aligning the axis of the superior and inferior obliques at about 51 degrees. So uh, that's basically fully adducting that eye so that the gaze is in line with that muscle, uh, the bell, the muscle belly, the vector of that muscle belly. So all of these extraocular muscles attach within the orbit. So, and all of them except for inferior oblique attach in the posterior orbit. We see here uh, the superior oblique and the levator palpebrae attaching posteriorly, uh, but most of the, the recti muscles all attach uh, 
to what's called a common tendinous ring in the posterior of the orbit. This common tendinous ring creates a kind of bottleneck and some of the nerves uh, that enter the orbit travel within the ring and some travel outside the ring. So by understanding which nerves are traveling inside and outside the ring, you can differentiate the functions of those nerves in the orbit and the forehead, the sensory components, the motor components, and you can identify whether there is a lesion or swelling or whatnot at the common tendinous ring. And that can give you an idea, is it intracranial or just intraorbital that there's a problem? So there's fun acronyms about how to remember what's inside the common tendinous ring and what's not. Uh, so one of my students uh, loved French toast and so came up with a, an, an acronym about French toast. Uh, I think it was uh, lovely French toast for lacrimal nerve, frontal nerve, and trochlear nerve uh, sit nicely in our abdomen. And so the sit nicely in our abdomen is the superior and inferior divisions of oculomotor, as well as uh, the, um, um, what is it, the nasociliary nerve and the abducens nerve. So uh, that's a, a fun acronym. There are many different ones to use. Uh, there are some classical colorful ones uh, as well, but uh, go with what works for you. Uh, so moving on, now we've highlighted in this next slide all of those nerves and the structures that travel through them. So lacrimation is an important uh, element that keeps the eye clean and functioning correctly. So the lacrimal gland in the superior lateral portion of the orbit is what uh, creates this functionality. And so uh, this lacrimal fluid will flush down toward the medial part of the eye, and from there it has to exit the eye, and it does so via these, uh, the nasolacrimal duct I mentioned in the facial development lecture. So the uh, entryway into the nasolacrimal duct is through the lacrimal uh, punctiva or punctum, and uh, that, uh, those combine into what's called a lacrimal sac, followed by the nasolacrimal duct. And the nasolacrimal duct opens into the inferior uh, meatus of the nasal cavity below the nasal concha, the inferior nasal concha. So uh, every time you swallow, you're constantly swallowing uh, mucus and tears that have entered your nasal cavity and flow down the back of your throat. So uh, we'll talk more about the innervation of the lacrimal gland in a little bit, but now let's talk about the blood supply. Uh, so I may have mentioned before, the ophthalmic artery is pretty much the first main intracranial branch of the internal carotid artery. So as soon as the internal carotid artery uh, leaves the carotid canal, then it will br uh, give off a branch um, called the ophthalmic artery, which travels anteriorly through the superior orbital fissure. Uh, once within the fissure, uh, so it's following the uh, optic nerve here um, briefly, uh, it will give off the lacrimal artery, which travels to the lateral side of the eye to supply the lacrimal gland and the structures, the um, the muscular structures and the mucosa of the lateral side of the eye. But the ophthalmic artery continues. Uh, it has given off the central retinal artery at this point, and the central retinal artery is actually encompassed by the optic nerve. So it's actually inside the optic nerve, surrounded by it at this point, which is why it's called the central artery of the retina. It's also given off ciliary arteries, ciliary arteries supplying uh, the eye becoming the, uh, you know, some of the arteries that are supplying the sclera of the eye. Uh, so there are long and short ciliary arteries, and we will see that um, that name is based on how far they go uh, to supply the, uh, the eye itself, not based on how long they are in the orbit. Now we also have superorbital artery uh, and supratrochlear. These are, they follow pretty much the paths of the superorbital and supratrochlear nerves, uh, and they're named similarly, so they will travel together. Uh, 
but the ophthalmic artery will also give off ethmoidal arteries and anterior and posterior that supply the ethmoidal air cells. Uh, there are two terminal branches of the ophthalmic artery, the dorsal nasal artery, as well as the supratrochlear artery. Uh, so now let's take a look at these arteries as they supply uh, the uh, choroid layer of the eye itself after piercing through the uh, sclera of the eye. So we see we have short and long ciliary arteries and we also have anterior ciliary arteries that are coming off of maybe the uh, supraorbital artery or the uh, supratrochlear or the ophthalmic artery further uh, down. So we see that long ciliary artery and short ciliary artery enter uh, the eye at the same point, but the long ciliary artery is going to travel farther, closer to the ciliary uh, body, whereas the short ciliary arteries are only supplying the posterior portion of the eye. Uh, so that is why they're named short and long. So within the orbit, you cannot distinguish one from the other because their name is based on their length in the eye itself. And then to drain the eye, of course, we have the vorticose veins within the choroid layer, and these will drain into the superior and inferior ophthalmic veins. Uh, so there's a uh, one uh, higher and one lower in the orbit, and they are actually connected to the uh, veins of the face. I mentioned this before when talking about a facial uh, drainage and the danger uh, zone of the face. So don't pop those pimples because the superior and inferior ophthalmic arteries drain intracranially into the cavernous sinus, as I mentioned before. They can also drain into the pterygoid plexus and the, uh, in the uh, pterygopalatine fossa. And so, um, uh, but uh, preferably, uh, we want to have this drainage go uh, exteriorly staying superficially in the face instead of draining into the cavernous sinus. So now let's talk about the nerve supply uh, and these branches of um, trigeminal as well as the other cranial nerves three, four, and six within the orbit. So these are right here the ophthalmic divisions of trigeminal, so these are V1 branches. We can see lacrimal nerve heading laterally to the lacrimal gland, and the frontal nerve uh, heading superior to the levator palpebrae superioris. That frontal nerve is going to branch off and give uh, and become the supratrochlear and supraorbital nerves that supply a sensation to the forehead of the face. So these are all GSA, also GSA. Uh, is the uh, nasociliary nerve. But before we get to that, we can see trochlear nerve heading over here to the superior orbital oblique muscle. So uh, that's, that's what you've got there. Now, uh, to look deeper into the orbit and find the rest, to look inside the cavernous, uh, the common tendinous ring, we're going to have to reflect the levator palpebrae superioris and the superior rectus muscle. So now that we've done that on this slide, we can see other components of the ophthalmic division. Uh, so these GSA components. So nasociliary nerve is going to be uh, the infratrochlear nerve that supplies uh, below the eye and a little bit around the nose. Uh, it gives off branches the uh, ciliary nerves, the ethmoidal uh, nerves that we can see here, long and short ciliary nerves. And so they're supplying the choroidal layer of the sclera. But uh, because the cornea has to remain clear, the cornea does not have sensory arborizations within it. It doesn't have any nerve arborizations within it. Uh, so uh, interesting to note the ciliary ganglion here within the orbit. Uh, so that is an important uh, parasympathetic ganglion that we will talk about uh, shortly. But uh, in addition to these branches of the ophthalmic division, these GSA branches, we have two more cranial nerves. We have oculomotor nerve, which is supplying the rectus muscles, except for lateral rectus, which is supplied by abducens cranial nerve. And we can see those here we can see abducens laterally, and that's on the internal side, the deep side of the lateral rectus muscle. Uh, 
and an oculomotor nerve is going to branch into two divisions, as I mentioned before when talking about the common tendinous ring. It is a superior and an inferior division. So superior division is going to supply these upper, uh, the superior rectus and the levator palpebrae superioris, whereas the inferior division is going to head down uh, to supply the inferior rectus uh, muscle. <clears throat> so that's it for this lecture. Thanks for watching.